Okay, this morning, picking back up in Ephesians, we are in Ephesians looking at submitting to one another. Prior to this, we were looking at the two states of a Christian. Now, of course, this comes off of 518, where it's talking about what well, Paul is stating here, uh, stop being drunk with, with wine. Remember your word, do not here, technically is expressing an activity that is going on. And he's saying, you guys need to stop doing this. They okay, stop being drunk with wine in which there is no saving this. Now it uses dissipation as the, the, the NAS actually uses that particular word. I think the King James says the same thing. Uh, but that really doesn't explain the word behind it. As we're looking at that is technically the word salvation negated. There's no savingness in there. That is when the mind is intoxicated, and by the way, it's not just with alcohol. He's using alcohol as an example here. But anything that's intoxicating the mind makes it impossible for us to focus or extremely difficult for us to focus on spiritual things. It doesn't work that way. You know, and he says, rather than being drunk with wine, you should be filled with the spirit. And of course, our word filled there does mean to be filled up where you're lacking or replenish would be another way of expressing that. Um, you are not, uh, it, it's the Holy Spirit then working through us. So we, his fruit is actually being manifested in us with this filling, this refilling. Then speaking to ourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs is, of course, is a, a an example of how you would be spiritual. A result of being spiritual, I guess is what I'm really trying to say. And do remember, if you haven't actually changed that in your translation, in, in verse 19, it says, it does not say speaking to one another. It's not other people. It's yourself. And this is a very specific Greek word. I have no idea why they opted to translate it uh, one another. It doesn't really make sense in the context either, because that's what he's talking about. Now, we get down to verse 21. He says, submitting one to another in the fear of God. And of course, fear, remember, it typically does express um, respect. Mature love casts out fear. So we're not talking about fear of judgment, but we are talking about fear in, in regards to the, the respect that we would have for God. Does God permit us as his children to act like the devil's child? He does not, and he will correct us. And we should be afraid of that aspect. But are we going to lose our salvation? No, that's not possible. As a matter of fact, his correction shows that it's not possible because he wouldn't correct us if it was possible. He'd let us go that direction. But he does actually correct us. So we should have respect, especially in the way that God has designed the church. Remember, the church is quite unique. We are part of one body, a new body, which would be the Christ. We all have parts within this one body, even though we are all one body, and we relate to each other. So there's an involvement there. Now, the word submitting, you really need to understand your word submitting. Because unfortunately, a lot of really bad definitions have been shoved into this word so that they can justify, well, typically where the justification is, is degrading a woman to a lower position. But that contradicts scripture, because in Christ, in the new creation, scripture says there is neither male nor female, which means there is an equality within the church. That does not take away the fact that a woman is not supposed to teach, because we all have specific positions within the, the body. But it also means that the pastor is not of more value than one who is an administrator, Well, an administrator could be a woman or other gifts. They all have equal value in how they actually administer their gifts. So we don't put one below the other. And people actually use this particular word to try to, to do that. It literally means to yield to another for the benefit that it actually brings. This particular word does actually have the concept of an added benefit. You are submitting to accomplish the task. That's what you're actually doing. It is technically a military term. It comes from the military. It's oftentimes used in there. And of course, one who is of a lower rank should be submitting to the one who is of a higher rank. Okay. 
Now, once you enter that agreement, that submitting, that doesn't mean you submit only when it actually suits you. Okay. You are making an agreement. You enter into the military. You are making an agreement, certain amount of pay. I am going to obey what my uh, those who are of higher rank are saying to me. That is what I'm going to do. And yes, in the military, that may mean I'm going to potentially die, depending on the situation. Okay. And just because I'm facing death doesn't mean oh, I don't want to actually submit anymore. It doesn't work that way. Okay. There is a proper submitting. The word itself, like I said, actually is a word that is, there's two different words put together, and it means to arrange yourself under. So you're arranging yourself under. So when it says submitting to one another, we're actually arranging ourselves under others. So we're giving them authority over us. Submitting to those who work and labor among us. We see this over in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 16. And you also submit to such ones and to everyone who works and labors with us. Well, why would you submit to them? Because they're working and laboring for your benefit. And if you're not submitting, you're not going to get that benefit. These are the people who are laboring. Being subject to rulers and authorities. For we ourselves were once fools, but let us not be anymore. This is over Titus chapter 3 and verse 1. God sets up and permits the governments, even though we look at some of our governments and they're extremely corrupt. Remember the time period we're in. We are in the, the age, the malignantly evil age. Now, an age is different from a dispensation. Dispensation deals with us as humans. We are in the dispensation of grace. Well, and what that means is those who are in the household their rule that what governs how they live is grace. Well, who are those in the household? It's only those who are in the church. So the world system does not live by grace. The world system does not have a standard to live by. Okay, now, that doesn't mean the world system can go do whatever it wants because it, the world system still, all those that are not saved, still have the knowledge of good and evil and are liable when they actually violate their conscience. So that's not a free license to them. It's God's not dealing with them. He's dealing with the church. Specifically, that's the dispensation of grace. But along with the dispensation of grace, we have the malignantly evil age. Now, the age is a period in which God shows something to intelligent beings about himself. And this may come as a shocker to some people, but humans are not the first created beings. Humans are not the center of the earth, of the world, I mean, of the universe. We are not the center of God's plan. As a matter of fact, Scripture is pretty clear when it comes to the church. He is going to show his kindness and grace through the church to the ages of the ages. Well, who is he showing them to? Other intelligent beings. Now, the spirits were created first. Okay. And by the way, this also completely contradicts the concept where some people want to say, well, the reason God created us is because God wanted a family. That's actually not true at all. Okay. Yes, we are God's children. Literally, those who believe the, the gospel for salvation, we actually become legitimate children of God. But he doesn't need anything. Okay. Why did God create? He was in a perfect state. There was no corruption. Why would he create? When, you, when we actually understand who God is, he has the inherent ability to create. It was only a matter of, for lack of a better way of expressing this, it was only a matter of time before he actually created. So he chose how he was going to do it. So that the creation that he made in the end is going to be very good. But he also understood in order to do that, he's got to he's got to work out some bad things, and he's got a plan for that. We are to be subject to the rulers and authorities, to uh, obey them, to be ready to do every good work. I mean, we're not doing bad work. Remember, when it comes to evil things, we are actually to refute them. We are to do good and suffer for doing good rather than doing bad. So it's not saying just because the government told you to do it. 
you got to do it. This is still submitting for the benefit okay? and submitting uh, for the proper um, system that God has actually set up for governing humans. Younger men are to submit to the older men. First Peter chapter five and verse five says, likewise, you younger submit yourselves to your elders or to your elder. Yes, all of you submit to one another and be clothed with humility for God resists the proud. They actually got the word humility correct here. It is the proper word. Because oftentimes they, they will translate it as, uh, well, they'll mistranslate this one. Or they'll translate the wrong word for like meekness. This would be your proper word for meekness. You know, and I mean the English concept of meekness, which would be humility, being humble. The, the olders are to submit, the, the younger men is to, are to submit to the older ones. The older ones should not be submitting to the younger. Pay attention, listen. That's what it's talking about submitting. Actually, if you submit properly to an older man, you're going to tend to learn a lot of things. A lot of good things that are beneficial for you. Not always. But a lot of times, actually, you do uh, glean some things from them. Then he goes on to talk about this kind of in different divisions. He says, so submitting to one another, this would be in uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. And he says, wives, submit to your own husband as to the Lord. She is not subservient to him like a slave. That is not what this word means. Okay, she, the, the marriage... A relationship is not a marriage, it's not a type of a relationship where you have one who is the master and one who is the servant. But a lot of times the word uh, submit is used to justify that kind of a relationship, and that's not an appropriate relationship within the marriage. It doesn't work that way, as a matter of fact. She is actually the despot of the house. So how can she be the despot of the house if she has to be subservient in everything to the man. That's not the way scripture actually describes it. That contradicts scripture, and scripture does not contradict itself. 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 14. Therefore, I determine, he does not say desire here, he actually says he's making a determination that the younger widows marry, bear children, and manage the house. Now, manage the house is not a, a not, not a terrible translation. I think some of the other ones will say uh, keep the house. Um, but it's literally your word from master and house put together, which means she is the household master. She's the one who's supposed to tend to the house. Tending to the household actually saves the woman from deception. This, remember is why a woman should not be a pastor. It isn't that the woman isn't intelligent enough. It's that the woman is more susceptible to being thoroughly deceived than the male. So, and Paul talks about that, but over in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, he says, nevertheless, she will be saved in childbearing if they continue in the faith, love, holiness, self-control. Now, in the context here is talking about a woman who, well, actually, specifically, it does say here, Adam was not deceived, but the woman was thoroughly deceived and fell into a transgression. Nevertheless, she will be saved. Saved from what? Saved from being deceived. Keep it in the context. Okay. I have actually heard people try to say that, that a, a child will actually save a person. That's how you actually get saved, is having a child, a woman. That completely contradicts the context of scripture here. It just rips it right out and says, well, that's a justification for making a woman have a child maybe when she's not ready to have a child. So you got to be saved, so you have to have a child. Okay. Yeah, I've heard of that. Uh, not so much in here in uh, the States, but I've heard it in other places. She is also not required to submit to other men, including those of the church. Now, this is in their relationship. Okay. She is married to one man. She submits to that one man. He is the head. The elder board is not the head of the marriage. 
It does not work that way. Now, again, I've run into a lot of, of, of people who try to use the word submit to justify that kind of a relationship. And that's not appropriate. That's not what scripture actually says. She is not to usurp authority over a man because she is to have it a proper position. This is within the church, too. It says in First Peter or First Timothy chapter 2 and verse 12, I do not permit a woman to teach nor to have authority over a man. Your word authority here is not your normal word for authority. It's actually a very specific word that would be better to translate it as usurp authority. You're taking, you're forcibly taking a position that you should not actually have. It's not used very often in scripture from what I recall uh, when I was looking at it. Um, I think this is probably the well, this is the only occurrence of it actually directly in Scripture, this particular word. But it does uh, come from a word. Let me pull this up real quick because I do believe it comes from Tithomy. And let me make sure I'm on the right word here. Um, it has, yeah, it comes, it has a root of oneself and it's placing oneself over another. Yeah, that would be actually your kind of expression there. Usurping. She's not to usurp the position. Uh, you know, a good example of a woman being deceived, by the way, is um, I, I remember an interview with one of the predominant so-called women preachers or pastors of our time. And somebody asked her, well, Scripture says that women are not to be teachers, not to be pastors, more specifically. I should be very specific on that, not to be pastors. And she says, well, I know, but I just feel that God wants me to do this. Or in other words, I know what God wants me to do, but uh, this is what I want to do, so I'm going to do it. You see the deception there. She's, she's perceiving herself as doing something good, yet she's contradicting what God actually said. That's not doing something good. We, we get the same thing with when, when we know the desires will of God and we decide to do something else. A good example, again, of this would have to do with marriage. A woman marries an unbeliever so that perhaps she can persuade him to become a believer, even though Scripture says, don't do that. That's not the desirous will of God for us. And that doesn't mean you can't have a dating type of a relationship, and then maybe the man actually will come to the Lord. But you don't do it to pull him over there. That's not appropriate. So she is not to usurp authority over the man. She is to learn in quietness. First uh, Timothy chapter 2 and verse 11 then says that. So I'm kind of backing up a little bit in the context here. Let a woman learn in silence with all submission. So she's putting herself under the the authority of those within the church in learning so that she can actually benefit from that. This, by the way, does not say that a woman is not to speak in the church. So much heresy comes out of these areas. It's just terrible. And, and it's really contradicting to Scripture and the purpose of the church. We are here to edify each other, to grow, to mature. There's nothing wrong with a woman being involved speaking. But what it's talking about is the woman is not to be in a disordered type of manner. Or another way of saying this is the women shouldn't be in the back yakking away about other things and not paying attention to the, to the service. Okay. That's what he means by silence. Silence literally means well-ordered. It does not mean keep your mouth shut. Not the right word. Um, and actually, there is a word that actually means to uh, not be running the job. Acts chapter 2, um, 22 and verse 2 talks about this. He uses the same word, silent. And when they heard that he spoke to them in Hebrew language, they kept all the more silent. Now, of course, what is happening is Paul was chased out of the temple by a few Jews from Asia who um, they've, they'd been trying to kill Paul for quite a while. And they had stirred up the city against him. Well, they thought that he was actually a Gentile who was trying to go into the temple. You know, and then he not only speaks to them, but he speaks to them in the Hebrew dialect. 
Now, he's not speaking to them in the Hebrew language. He's speaking to them in the Hebrew dialect. What would be the difference? The difference is how I speak compared to somebody who lives in New York speaks. So when he spoke in this way, he's like, this man's from actually from here. He's using our dialect. That caused them to just be like, oh, pay attention, shut up. Or well-ordered. They're all listening at this point. That's what it's talking about here when it says that. But she is to submit for the benefit that it would bring in relation to the marriage. The husband is the wife. Uh, the husband is the head of the wife. So you have this in back over in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 23 through 24. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is also the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Now, I will tell you that in the context here, Paul is mixing in a mystery, and he's going to explain this here shortly, but he's mixing in a mystery that actually the marriage relationship in the church, because it's only to be between one male and one female, that's it, shows an example of this relationship. Okay? And it's important to pay attention to, because how is Christ the head of the church? Christ is the one who really gives the church direction. Okay, here's he's the one we pay attention to. We're, what what whose will are we supposed to be doing? Our will or God's will? Now Christ is God in the flesh. Okay? And it is talking about God the Father, but what was Christ actually doing here? What did he say he, as, in regards to his will? I'm not here to do my will, I'm here to do Father's will. So since we are in Christ, what should our focus be? To do the Father's will. That's the direction we actually have. That's the head. That's what it's talking about. Okay. Just like the, the husband is the head of the wife. She submits in a like manner to how Christ, or how the church submits to Christ. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands. And he, by the way, he said this twice already, to their own husbands, not to other men, but to their own husbands. Christ gave him gave to the church gifts for its maturity. And do you, you, when you think about how did Christ actually, how does he relate to the head of the, uh, being the head of the body? Yeah, he gives us our direction, but what else does he actually give us? He gave us gifts for our edification, so that we in the body can grow and mature. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16 talks about this. And he himself gave some to be apostles and some prophets and evangelists and some pastors, even teachers. Remember in the context here, pastors, even teachers, that is referring to the same person. It's not uh, separate pastors or separate teachers. For the equipment of the saints or the equipping of the saints for a work of the ministry for the edification of the body. The body of the Christ. For our edification to bring us to a oneness of faith. The man is responsible for the direction of the household. Actually, we see this in the requirements for a pastor. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 4 talks about this. So backing up a little bit, he says, a bishop then must be blameless. Now remember, this is in verse 2. Remember, the concept of a bishop is one who has, the well, typically it's one who has a, the gift of a pastor who is in the position of a bishop in an assembly. So we would call that typically today a pastor. So when he's, uh, it's used synonymously that way. So he's, he's giving instructions on that. And here in verse four, he says, and he and who rules his own household well, having children in submission with all reverence. Your word rule here does not mean to hold a position of authority like a king or one who is in governmental position. It's not that kind of word. It actually is a word that literally means to stand before them. The father should be the example. He should be guiding them. He should be leading them. 
That's the point here. Okay. The husband provides what the household needs for spiritual growth and maturity. That's his job. So within the relationship, now this is whether you have children or not, it doesn't matter because right at the moment we're talking about the relationship between the husband and the wife. The husband is the head would supply and ensure that he's supplying things for the wife for her to also grow and mature. Okay. But they're given one direction. You, know, you can't have two heads. It, do, it just doesn't work. You know, you have to have one. The husband is to seek the best for his wife, Ephesians chapter 5. Back over in Ephesians, that is, Ephesians chapter 5, and starting in verse 25. This is his here, husbands, love your wives. Now, what does he mean by love your wife? You know, the word love here is agape. You need to seek the best for her. That's what this particular word love is. This word love is not be really fond of her. There's other words that relate to that, but this particular one, that's not what he's talking about. He's saying you seek the best for her. Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Now, should the man then be willing to die for, the, for his wife? Well, in most cases, yeah, there wouldn't be a question about that. But would a man be willing to live for his wife? Does Christ, is Christ dead? He's not. Yes, he did die, but the end result was he was raised from the dead. And where is he at now? At the third, he's in the third heaven, at the right hand of God, interceding on our behalf. It's still there for us, focusing. So keeping that focus. The husband is to set apart the wife. She is to be holy to him. There should be no other woman who has that same type of classification in his life, not even his mother. Okay. She should be set apart. And then when he says that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, now this is Christ who actually gave himself, and, and Christ is being used as an example for the husband, set her apart. Okay. She should be quite unique in your life. You know, there, there's no others that actually should ever hold that position. So um, it also then goes on to talk about nourishing your own, uh, your own flesh in the same way that the Lord provides for the church. The husband provides an, an environment for the spiritual maturity of the wife. So in verse 26, it says that he might sanctify that is set apart and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the blood or by the uh, the washing of the water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or anything such any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So the husbands ought to love their wives. Now, it does not say that we can save our, our wives. It's not the context there. It's showing us that, that Christ set apart the church and did what was best for the church so that he could present us properly. Same thing here for the husband. So ought the, the so the husbands are, ought to love their wives, and they should love them in a way as though they love their own bodies. Are you willing to do things for your body? You know, he who loves his wife also loves himself. Is is an expression of love towards yourself, which is kind of interesting. Yeah, it's kind of it's it's a very similar concept within the church. How do we actually love God? Do I tell God I love Him, or do I obey His commandments? And what do His commandments say? Love one another. When I am loving other saints, I am actually loving God. Same kind of concept. Okay. I'm doing the best for her because yes, that actually does benefit me also. But in this case, you know, it's, well, it, it benefits both. For no one has ever been indifferent to his own flesh. And your word hate here actually means indifferent. This is in verse 29. It does not mean you're, you hate it. It's, it means you're completely indifferent to it. And even those people who try to go and, and hide in caves and, and escape the flesh, which, of course, you bring the flesh with you, so that doesn't work very well. But even those who try to uh, are harsh on the flesh and stuff like that, the purpose is 
to save their flesh, to save them. That's the whole purpose of it. So nobody is indifferent to his own flesh, but on the contrary, nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord also does the church. So he's giving us an example there. The husband and the wife are one member. They're, they're of the same body. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 30, for we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bone. Now, of course, here is talking about the fact that the church is actually in Christ, the new creation. We are actually a part of Christ. In the same way, prior to salvation, we were actually a part of Adam. Why are we all condemned? Because Adam was condemned. His punishment was passed on to us. Why do we have a sin nature? Because Adam passed it on to us. Now, don't use that as an excuse and say, well, it's Adam's fault. Because he also gave us enough knowledge and, well, that we gave us a knowledge of good and evil. So we could actually do things that are right. We just choose not to. That's our own fault. But within the body of Christ, we're actually immersed into the Christ, the new creation. And therefore, we are his body, his flesh, his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Okay. So in the context here, he's talking about, you know, the husband and the wife are members of one body. And what he's using as an example is the Christ. The Christ is also, we are all part of one body. Uh, we see this actually, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17 is where we see that Christ is the new creation. And I will say this every single time I come to this verse because I have not found a good translation for this verse. Get a good translation or write it in your Bible because most of our translations today are absolutely terrible because they add in a few things that are not accurate. They add in the word he is and there is no he is there. You are not a new creation or creature in Christ. Christ is the new creation. Wherefore, since someone is in Christ, a new creation is talking about Christ. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That is really important to understand because you do not become a new creation. You are not a new creature. You are a part of a new creation. You belong to it. And actually, if I belong to a new creation, should I be involving myself with the old? That wouldn't make any sense. I'm not part of the old anymore. I'm now part of the new. Uh, keeping that uh, uh, heavily focused in our lives. The husband and the wife are one flesh. You see this back over in, oh, actually, 1 Corinthians, before I jump down, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through 13, talks about the fact that the Christ is like one body. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 12 says, For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is the Christ. And there's actually an article there. It, uh, it sounds funny in English until you understand what it's referencing. And then it's perfectly fine. For by one spirit we were all immersed into one body, whether Jew or Greek, whether slave or free, and we all have been made to drink into one spirit. We're all part of one body. The church. Now, in verse 30, uh, 32, Ephesians chapter 5, or yeah, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 32, he then goes on um, and he says, This is a great mystery which I speak concerning Christ and the church. Uh, the husband and wife are one flesh in verse 31, where he talks about this. So the mystery that he's referring to here isn't marriage. It isn't the marriage of uh, the, those who are in the church. A mystery is something that was hidden, but is now actually revealed to us. So Romans is one of, one of the areas where you actually get an example of this. Romans chapter 16, verses 25 through 26. Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation... Of the mystery kept secret or kept hidden since the beginning of the age. But now, or ages actually, 
but now had but now made manifested by the prophetic scriptures made known to all nations according to the commandments of the everlasting God for obedience to the faith. It was hidden, but is now actually revealed. Okay. So he is talking about a mystery, but he's not talking about something we cannot understand. We are actually to understand mysteries. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 4. By which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of the Christ. We should actually understand the mystery of the Christ. But it wasn't revealed in the Old Testament. It's revealed in the New Testament, and there's plenty of, ever, of information there for us to understand it. And this, of course, is over in Colossians. It's been revealed to us. Colossians chapter 1, verse 26. The mystery which has been hidden from the ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to the saints. Now has been revealed to us. Okay. Marriage is not, like I said, marriage isn't the mystery that he's talking about here. And one of the reasons why we can really point to the fact that it's not a mystery is go all the way back to Genesis chapter 2 and verse 24, where we only have two people. And this is the introduction of the second person. So Adam was created, and then God showed Adam. And remember, what in the pause between creating a, a man and a woman, there's some time to give Adam an understanding that there is no other created being like him. On the earth, there's nobody else like him. God brings all the animals before him, and he understands. He understands these animals, and he's looking. There's not a single one that could be a mate for me. No one to be a helpmate before me. And then God causes him to go to sleep. He takes uh, from the side. He forms a woman. He actually literally builds her, is the way the scripture describes it. She's not a new creation. She's built from Adam. And as a matter of fact, when God created Adam, he said right from the very beginning, he created them male and female. But he didn't create them at the same time. Well, that's not entirely true. He didn't build them at the same time. Let's put it that way. That's a better way of expressing it. So he builds Eve and he or the woman and he brings her to Adam. And Adam's response is... Therefore, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. He understood this is one flesh. This is my flesh. Flesh of my flesh. And this is what's going to happen in the marriage relationship. So he's not talking about when he says, and this is a mystery over and back over in Ephesians chapter 5. He doesn't say this is a mystery in the sense of a marriage is a mystery. No, he's saying the mystery was concerning Christ in the church. It wasn't revealed before, but it is revealed now. The man is to seek the best for his wife, and the wife is to respect the husband. Nevertheless, each one of you, and actually, the way that this is translated, um, it's kind of interesting. Uh, I translated a little bit different in the uh, in the bulletin there, I translated the for the verse. It says, "Nevertheless, also you, according to each one, each concerning his own wife, thus let him love as himself, and the wife is in order that she respect the husband." So she is to respect the husband. She is to be fond of the husband in the marriage relationship. Does this mean that a woman does not have to love her husband? No, actually. I've, actually, I've heard that. Well, the man has to love the woman. The woman only has to be fond of the man. You're missing one element of that. They're also both Christians. And if they're both Christians, they should be expressing love towards each other as fellow saints also. But within the marriage relationship, the man being the head, the woman's going to need to respect his position as being the head. So it might be, yeah, we have a decision to make, and it doesn't matter which way we go, but you're the one that's picking it because you're the head. And I'm going to follow you wherever you go. She's showing him respect is what she's doing. This is the direction. This is the way. Thing. 
He then goes on to talk about children. And he says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. This is a just thing for children. It's, it's a just thing for them to be obedient to their parents. Uh, he then goes on, and by the way, obedience literally means to listen under. Listen, pay attention. And of course, the listening is not just hearing. It's actually responding. They say something, you, you do what they actually want. You pay attention to what they're saying. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. Now, I thought we weren't under the Mosaic law. As Christians, we don't live by the Mosaic law. But he actually quotes the Mosaic law here. He says, honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. The, the first commandment that he's talking about, we actually see this over in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse uh, 16, he talks about this. He says, honor your father and your mother. As the Lord your God has commanded you that your days may be long and that it may be well with you in the land which the Lord, has, uh, the, which the Lord your God has given to you. Now, this is clearly to Israel. It is not to the Gentiles here. Um, but he's actually quoting this. You know, we don't govern our lives by law, not the Mosaic law. We as Christians do not govern our, ourselves in that way. But that does not mean we ignore the Mosaic law. Okay? If I am actually living out who I am in Christ, what will happen to the Mosaic law in my life? What aspect would the Mosaic law have in my life? It doesn't, it doesn't govern what I do. And what I mean by that is I'm not going to set up the Ten Commandments and say, thou shalt not do these things. What am I going to do as a Christian? What's my standard? It is to love and to do good to everybody. So love would be to the other to fellow Christians. Doing good would be to those who are outside. Specifically, our commandment is to love other Christians and this is seeking the best for other Christians. Am I going to disrespect my parents if I'm actually loving my parents? No. I would actually honor them. It's a fulfillment of the law. You know, in Matthew chapter 5, I think it's in verse 17, Jesus said, I did not come to loose the law. I came to fulfill it. The Mosaic law is, is, is actually a very rational Law. It's a very rational standard. It makes sense. Don't take somebody else's stuff. It doesn't belong to you. Okay. Don't put others in front of God. There's only one God. All the others are just sticks and stones that people are pretending to be God so they can justify, really, their corrupt action and, and fulfill their own fleshly desires. That's all they are. Okay. So... The law is actually logical. It makes sense. We want to be careful not to try to govern our... our um, we don't want to govern ourselves by the Mosaic Law because the direction is wrong. And what I mean by that is if you're always trying to do or to not do something, because that's do not, you will never actually be involved in the doing part. But if you're actually doing, what happens to the do not? Well, they're contrary to each other. If I'm expressing love towards another person, I will never do anything that is in the do not category. It's just not part of what I'm doing. But it's logical, like I said, here in Romans chapter 7 and verse 14. For we intuitively know that the law, and now it uses the word spiritual here. Okay, but spiritually, you need to understand what that word actually means. Because our spirit is our rational part, our intellectual part. The law is rational, but I am fleshly, sold under sin. Well, what does the sin nature like to do when it comes to the law? It uses it to manipulate us, thinking we're doing a good thing, so that it actually can start to cause other problems. Well, and a good example is Paul gives this. He says, I really wouldn't have known covetousness if the law didn't say thou shalt not covet. And it says thou shalt not covet. And then Paul 
finds himself actively attempting to take other people's stuff. And what do I mean by that? Covetousness, remember, the Mosaic Law does not deal with thoughts. The Mosaic Law deals with actions. We typically put the word covet in our mind. We, we, we restrict it to something, oh, I'm desiring what somebody else wants. I'm coveting. Actually, coveting is I am actively seeking to take what another person has. That's what I'm doing. It's an action. It's not in the mind. Okay. So Paul, he has a situation, and Paul, is he's in Tarsus right now. He kind of was on a break, shall we say, because um, nobody really wanted to invite him in because of, of the kind of person he was before Christ actually saved him. Um and there was a few, and there was a few who kind of accepted him, but for the most part, they, the people were very scared of him. I mean, he persecuted the church. He had people thrown into prison and some put to death. They were afraid of him. So there was a time period where he was in Tarsus where he was given so that he could apply the, the actual doctrine he had learned to his life. And in doing that, he says, well, I'm in coveting, he finds himself, thou shalt not covet. And then he finds himself taking what belongs to another person and seeking after that and desiring it. It's like, no, because the law, the sin nature is going to use the law. And it's going to use it in a way to where we work out the things we don't want to do. And we don't do the things that we want to do. So the law is logical. We are to govern our lives out from faith by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit's going to produce fruit in our lives. And this fruit, of course, relates to our conduct. This is not contrary to any law. You know that the fruit of the Spirit, and actually we can go over there, Galatians is where it talks about that. Uh, Galatians chapter 5. Because it talks about the fruit of the Spirit here. So in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, it says, but the fruit of the Spirit is, and by the way, it's singular. It's a single fruit not fruits, one fruit. So if you're expressing one aspect of it, you have access to all other aspects of it too. As a matter of fact, most of the time, you are expressing two or three different aspects of the fruit at the same time. And predominantly, you are expressing love pretty much when you're expressing every other aspect of the fruit of the Spirit. Because it's kind of what holds everybody together, but it's all one fruit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, um, objectivity of mind. It's not your word gentleness. It's objectivity of mind. Self-control. Against such there is no law. We do not need a thou shalt not because we would never do anything that would violate the law. But we don't ignore the law. Okay, Caring for your parents is important especially caring for them in their old age. Uh, Matthew chapter 15, verses 4 through 6, talks about this, uh, where we have the Pharisees who were trying to manipulate the situation um, so that they didn't have to actually do this. And that is, honor their mothers and fathers. So here in uh, Acts chapter or Matthew chapter 15, verses 4 through 6, it says, For God commanded, saying, Honor your father and your mother, and he who curses his father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, whoever says to his father or mother, whatever profit you might have received from me as a gift of God, then he need not honor his father and mother. Thus you have made the commandments of God of no effect by your traditions. So what they were saying is, well, I've dedicated all my money to God, so I don't have any money to take care of you. So that they could get out of having to take care of their parents. No, we need to honor our parents. Be obedient. Care for them in their old age. And actually, there is a promise attached to that. And, and that promise is even true to us today. Because like I said, the law is logical. Okay? If we're honoring our parents, we will actually get long life. 
That's one of the promises that relates to that type of activity. And then in verse uh, 4, in, in um, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4, he goes on to say, and you fathers don't provoke your children to wrath. Um, it really, this provoking to wrath kind of has the idea of infuriating your children. And this would come because the father, well, typically it'll be the father, is harassing his children. He's giving them a hard time. He's making things uh, difficult on them because he finds it funny. You know, it's that kind of activity, you know. Well, you just have to do it because I told you you have to do it. It's causing frustration in the child. That's not an appropriate way for us to actually raise our children. And he, and he talks about this. And, and you, fathers, do not provoke. And your word provoke here literally means to, uh, to bring wrath alongside. Don't bring wrath alongside your children. But bring them up, and your your word bring them up here in, in what you're doing is bringing them up in child training and admonition, which is putting to the mind of the Lord. You're teaching them. You're training them. You know, admonition can also involve not doing things. So you're instructing them, don't do this, and this is why you shouldn't do it. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 11 talks about this. For now all these things happened to them as an example that was, and they were written for our admonition upon whom the end of the age come, or the end of the age has come. Why were the things written that happened to actually Israel? Why do we have that in our scriptures? So that we as Christians know what not to do. Pay attention. What often did they not do? They didn't follow God's word. And they went after their own things. We as Christians shouldn't do that. You know, so this does involve, by the way, being spiritual. Because you're going to have to go back up to the spiritual first. So being obedient to your parents does not make you spiritual. If you are spiritual, you will be obedient to your children. It's just like... Obeying the Mosaic law does not make you righteous before God. Living out from faith actually does mean you're not going to violate anything related to the law because you'll be taking God at his word. And God tells us to love other, other Christians. And we are actually instructed to do good to those who are without. You know, it, um, in talking about submitting, we're to be ready to submit to the authorities and governments of men for what purpose? To do good. Doing good. In doing good, we're not going to violate the law. 